Welcome to the Dialogue by Wirepoints, connecting the dots between our economy, government, and people. And now your hosts, Ted Dabrowski and Mark Glennon. Hello, and welcome back to the Dialogue Wirepoints podcast. And this is Ted Dabrowski, and I'm here with Mark Glennon. And today we're going to talk about a pretty big fiasco, and that's the population of Illinois. What the heck is the population? Is it growing, shrinking? There's been a big mess in that because uh, the U.S. Census Bureau came out with numbers that uh, dramatically contradict what it's been saying over the last few years. So we'll get to that. And of course, um, you know, the, the big issue there is that the IRS says, whoops, we undercounted Illinois along with some other states. And therefore, we believe Illinois' population will be bigger than we've said and of course, politically, that's been a big, uh, a big grab for Governor Pritzker because he's out there cheering the fact that Illinois is growing again. So we'll talk about that. Uh, after that, though, we're going to bring in the new IRS numbers that came out just a few days after the census correction. And the IRS numbers, the Internal Revenue Service numbers that tracks migration from state to state said, uh oh, watch out. Illinois lost 100,000 people net to other states. And uh, it's the third biggest loser in the country behind California and New York. So that's the, the, that's the number that we, we believe is a, a very uh, valid number because it's a hard number. It comes from tax returns. We'll hit into that. And then uh, you know, Mark did a, a nice piece wrapping all this up. Uh, and then last, um, we want to talk a little bit about the two debates. Uh, not so much about the debates per se, but there were two debates uh, for the Republican gubernatorial uh, candidates. And, um, you know, we're a 501c3, so we can't endorse any candidate, but we can, we certainly can talk about what policies they should be talking about and what you as a, if you're a reformer, if you want to see, or if you just want to see a better Illinois, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what you should be looking for in your candidate or potential candidates. So Mark, let's open up with uh, the census stuff and um, just a little bit of background For six years in a row, if I have it right, the U.S. Census has an estimate each year, and they said that Illinois was shrinking. And once we got to 2019, they were saying that Illinois was going to shrink by by about 250,000 people, which would have made it maybe the biggest shrinker in the country. Um, When they finally came out with their numbers, they they uh, when they ran the, uh, the, the the decennial census count for 2020. They finally said, well, you know what? It wasn't 250,000 short. It was only 18,000 short. That was still the third worst in the country, second worst in the country. Only three states shrunk. It was us, West Virginia, and Mississippi. But then about, what is it, two, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, they came out and said, well, oops, maybe we made another error. We may have undercounted by 2% Illinois' population. So, um, Mark, tell us a little bit about what you think about that and, and that whole process there. Yeah, so let's understand that the census is a straight count. They actually try to go around and count up people, and they're they're bound by law. There's a, a Supreme Court case back in 1999 that says that that's how you got to do the official census. Well, every they do that, of course, every ten years that full count. And mark mark that means no statistical estimates. It's got to be a count. Right. No adjustments. No inferences. You know, uh, algorithms. Nothing. Um, but every year. Uh, they know that there's errors in the census. Everybody knows that. So experts don't dis, uh, disagree with that. So after those 10-year censuses, they, they do something called a PES, which is a, a survey, a random survey of, uh, they used 180,000 people out of our 380 million people, 180,000 households, I should say, um, to try to identify where they thought there were errors. And uh, the PES this year identified a number of states that had overcounts and a number of states that had undercounts. And they said Illinois is one of those with a pretty significant undercount, that uh, they missed 1.97% of the population. Well, if that's true, that would swing the population for Illinois to a positive number, uh, right about 13 million, as opposed to the uh, 12.8 million, I think, which it is that for the uh, right. official census. Uh, well, this has caused all kinds of confusion. And as you'd expect, Illinois politicians, particularly Governor Pritzker, have said, hey, hallelujah. And the press, of course, prints this up in headlines all across the street. 
the narrative that Illinois is losing population is a myth and we're gaining population. We've turned Illinois around. Person, you know, Pritzker takes personal credit for this. Well, there's all kinds of things wrong with that conclusion. Um, first of all, the, the Census Bureau put this PES out in a terribly ham-handed uh, fashion without communicating it properly. Uh, Ted, you and John Klinger, our research director, spent an hour on the phone with them trying to clear, clear, clear this up. Uh, uh, it's not conclusive in itself. It is a survey, but that's really just the beginning of the problems in what's going on. For starters, the census and the PES have an effective date of April 1, 2020. So that means it's over two years old now. So Pritzker and everybody else are ignoring what's happened in the past two years. There's every reason to think that uh, those two years have been our worst population losses ever. Uh, for starters, the uh, April 1st happens to be right about the date that the crime surge uh, happened. And of course, the, the riots of, of uh, summer 2020 followed that. Uh, the Census Bureau's own estimate that came out for 2021 showed it the worst ever, losing 114,000 people um, in just one year. Uh, thirdly, and most importantly, actually, we have IRS migration data. Uh, Ted, which you and John did uh, a fantastic job on, and we got this out first. Um, and we'll go into that in, in detail in a minute, Ted. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, but finally, there's also the movers numbers, which are very compelling. Um, they consistently show the the rate of move outs versus move ins is two to one, twice as many move ins as move outs. Uh, excuse me, move twice as many move outs as move ins. Um, that's the most recent one you can find is from Allied Van Lines. It's a national survey. Uh, so no, there's not uh, the minimum that you can say with absolute logical certainty is that was baseless to make claims that Illinois is growing or that it has grown in recent years or during the Pritzker administration. There's nothing in the PES or census to say that. But uh, more importantly, all of the direct evidence continues to say that Illinois is losing population in the later years. You know, Ted, I compared it to the 10 year census to uh, there's an elm tree in my neighbor's front yard growing beautifully for 10 years from 2010 to, tw to 2020, uh, right about 2017, uh, they got Dutch elm disease. They get, uh, it's being treated for it now, but it's suffering. Limbs are coming off. Um, the point is that what happened over the course of 10 years doesn't tell you what happened during those 10 years. And if, again, the census has indicated that there was moderate growth early in those 10 years, but the departures started to occur later, just when we in the Tribune and many others started to focus on those. It's about five or six years ago. I think what really sparked it was a survey done by a, a polling agency here that uh, found in 2016 that half of them of Illinoisans said they wanted to move out. Well, it takes time for that to happen. You know, people got to get a new job, sell their houses, all the rest, let their kids get out of school. And so it's only now that we're seeing the uh, the effects of this. And Ted, the, the best direct evidence, because you can't fudge it, is the number of taxpayers that file in the states. The IRS has those numbers. Obviously, they just count them up. They know how many taxpayers there are and their dependents. They publish those every year. The most recent came, one came out just this week. And uh, tell us what, you, what you've what uh, found there, Ted. Yeah, Mark, before before hitting the IRS, I want to make a couple comments to, to some of the things you made, uh, all of which I, I think are spot on. Um, one thing I do want to clarify, and you mentioned that we spoke to to the Census Bureau. You know, the hard part I had with everything was that, you know, Governor Pritzker and others were, like you said, celebrating and saying the population is 13 million. It's 13 million. And what they were doing is that they were adding 2% onto what the Census Bureau had said the population was back in earlier in this year when they did the decennial, uh, the 10 year survey. So, you know, the census came out with 12.8 million. That's what they said the population was. And then since then, they said a 2% error. Well, 
if the population of Illinois really had changed to 13 million, I wanted to see the number. I wanted to see where the census published that because that's the only way you can say that. And uh, we couldn't find it anywhere. So we called the census and the person there, the spokesperson there said, no, the population of Illinois is still 12.8 million. And I say that only because it's, it's a matter of fact. We can think it might change. We might think there might be more people here. But the, but the factual matter is 12.8 million. And that number is what matters for congressional delegation. Uh, it will matter for many of the uh, federal funding formulas that, that look at population. And so that's a fact. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, well, let's say, um, let, let's take it for granted that that there is a 2% increase somehow. Um, and, and just to clarify, that 2% comes from Mar what Mark said is a very, very small survey that what we were told by the census, you can't apply the error term, that 2%, to the entire population because it's just not a, a apples, it'd be like apples to oranges. So, um, but, the, but the point I want to make there is we do know, for example, births and deaths are very hard numbers. Those are clear numbers. They come from the vital statistics from hospitals, et cetera. So we, we know those, those are hard numbers. We also know very hard numbers from what Mark just said, the IRS. We know who's moving in and moving out because you can track those who, who um, file taxes. So the wild card is that last one, which is the last component of population change, and that's net international immigration. And so this was a really hard one. It's, it's only a guess. Um, but if we are seeing massive growth, we know that we're having massive growth coming, people coming through our borders uh, down south. And, you know, there, there's, there's a chance that we're getting a lot of international immigrants. Uh, they, maybe they don't use U-Hauls to move in. Uh, they don't file taxes, so they're harder to track. Uh, and, and maybe the census estimates that, that that new error term might pick up some of that. But we don't know and we won't know until we do a, a census 10 years from now. Mark, you got a point. Yeah, uh, Ted, just to uh, clarify on that, too. Uh, remember, Governor Pritzker, at the time of the census, did a, a huge effort to try to run up the the, the uh, census numbers, outreach programs and all the rest. To his credit, I think that's wise. You know, it protects the size of our congressional delegation uh, and all. And then in November of 2020, the state itself issued a statement saying that there was no overcount. Uh, they said they reached 99.9% .9 of the people of Illinois. Well, if that's true, of course, that blows their new claims uh, out of the water. Were they lying then? Are they lying now? Uh, and, and the second thing that that illustrates is you can't compare the results of the 2020 census to the 2010 census, which is how they're coming up with the supposed increase, because there was no such outreach program in 2010. And uh, we don't know for sure how many uh, undocumented immigrants it picked up, but uh, that, that number is no doubt large. And all evidence indicates that that's where the supposed growth came from, namely the that uh, IRS data. Uh, there's apparently maybe people here who are not uh, use filing tax returns. And it would make sense that those are undocumented immigrants. Uh, that's exactly what was said by a uh, University of Illinois professor, said that to WBEZ, WTTW rather, she predicted that after we dig into these numbers a little bit more, we'll find that the the swing here is in undocumented workers. Well, we are, we are a welcoming state and... Um, you know, and um, the other point, just to, to finalize your point, we spent almost $50 million in trying to find more people in the census uh, in 2020. So you're right. So whatever it is, it's not a like for like comparison. So this is, I think, a good segue into the IRS data, because before I talk about the IRS data, there's one particular it, uh, fact that's really interesting. And, you know, the IRS, it's really easy, right? The IRS knows last year where you filed your tax return. It knows where you filed your tax return this year. So it can tell what state you were living in last year, what state you're living in this year. And, you know, basically, did you move somewhere? It also knows how many dependents you have because you put that on your tax return. Uh, and it also knows how much money you make because that's the, the money you filed. So it's really easy for the IRS to track all the inflows into a state, all the outflows from a state. And um, if you look at Illinois, the one interesting fact, and, and, you know, and this is hard to tell what's behind these numbers, but, but maybe... Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting fact. The average income of the filers who left Illinois was $105,000.
and the average income of the filers who came into Illinois was, uh, and I hope I don't mess up my number, $70,000. Um, so there's a, 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 a 65, there's a $30,000 difference between those who came in and those who came out. And, uh, you know, it's hard to tell what that is, but, but partially what, what it's showing is, is that we're losing our tax base and we're losing our wealthier people and we're gaining people when they do come in who are much poorer, whether that's some of a uh, lower income, some of that Im immigrants, hard to say, but uh, it's, it's a damning number because not only are we losing net people, we lost 100,000 net people in that IRS data, but the ones we did gain made a lot less than the ones we lost. Yeah, and billions of, of income go with that, too. Uh, you've aggregated up the total loss to adjusted gross income that has gone with those people. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's in the uh, many billions over 8, the 8.5 billion. 8.5 billion. Yeah, the adjusted right. gross income is 8.5 billion that, that on net we lost. We can't yeah, tax that. You know, that loss of the tax base is is the reason why this is important. It's not the size of the congressional delegation because that, that as I say, is fixed by law. It must be done off the count of the census. Um, there's also this issue of how federal tax dollars gets uh, split up. That's based on the census. But, but Pritzker, again, commendably, is now lobbying Congress to recognize these PES numbers. So maybe he'll succeed with that. He might get some help, by the way, from red states because the other states that had the biggest uh, uh, supposed undercount are Texas and Florida, um, which had no outreach programs to Ill undocumented immigrants or anybody else. Um, so uh, you're going to have um, hopefully more discussion coming up on this. Hopefully, so far, the press has entirely ignored this topic. They gleefully reprint Pritzker's comments about this and uh, nobody has bothered to report on the IRS information with, with two exceptions, Center Square and Jim Dye, who's a uh, columnist at the News Gazette in, in uh, Champaign. That's it. Everybody else has, has gotten what's fake news. I'm sorry, it's fake news. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. The, um, so the IRS data you know, shows, again, that uh, Illinois lost on net – 100,000 people, and that's 8.5 billion in, in taxable revenue that we could have had. So we're the third worst in the country. And uh, New York was the biggest loser of, of money. Uh, they lost 19.5 billion in, in taxable income. California was second, and we were third. So you kind of see who we're hanging out with is the, um, you know, us and the, the, you know, the coastal states as the ones losing people and losing money. Uh, you know, compare that to, to the winners, Florida, Florida, the massive winner. It's been the massive winner for for past decade. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, Texas, the other big winner. Arizona, Carolina, Carolina, Tennessee. You know, it really is kind of a red 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 state versus blue state thing, uh, for the most part. And um, you know, really, what it says is, you know, these states states are competing year after year. They're competing for people, for investment, for growth. And when you look at a place like Florida that wins every single year. Well, think about that. If you're winning new people, uh, their incomes are high. A lot, some of them are retirees, but not just retirees. They're, they're winning people. They're winning their, their taxable income, and they're winning investment. And so when you pile that on year after year after year, if you pile that on every year on top of each other, then you are, you are growing your economy. You're growing your state. You know, on the opposite side are states like New York and, and, and Illinois, where you lose part of your tax base. 20 years in a row. We've tracked this data back to 20, you know, 20, uh, 2000. And if you pile each year, because, you know, if you lose money, if you lose some of your AGI in 2000, well, it's gone in 2001 and 2002 and 2003, all the way through 2020. Then what you lose in 2001 is lost all the way through 2020. So if you just keep stacking up your losses, New York has lost a cumulative $1 trillion in AGI that it could have taxed over those 20 years. It's a massive number. And, uh, you know, Illinois is, is massive as well. So this is money that's gone and you can't grow. You know, if we had kept all of those people that, that left, we would have an additional $3 billion in, in tax revenues, just state tax revenues this year alone. It's a massive number. We wouldn't have the problems we have if we could keep our people. But that's the problem. 
that there is no scenario for fixing Illinois, restoring it to a competitive position or stabilizing its fiscal situation without growth in our tax base. And even if these PS numbers were, were true, the, the growth is tiny. We're getting vastly outpaced by, by other states who are growing at a, at a faster rate. So this just doesn't cut it. The problem remains the same. That's right. Um, and I, you know, I was looking for the Illinois numbers. This, uh, so our cumulative losses are $535 billion that we could have taxed in, 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 in total over that 20-year period. Um, if we had kept, if we just broken even every year, we would have last year or 2020, we could have taxed an additional 60, what is that, $67 billion that would have been taxable here. And that would have made, made a big difference in our incomes. But and it's gone. And of course, it's not just the taxes they pay. The uh, uh, Those people who have fled, if had they been here, spend money providing incomes to other people in all kinds of trades and stores and everything else. And they, they give philanthropically. They invest here. Um, they're gone. All right, Mark. Another interesting thing uh, um, was the debates. And what was interesting about the, de the gubernatorial debate is that it wasn't one debate. It was two debates. NBC had three of the candidates and uh, WGN had the other three candidates a couple hours apart. Uh, a lot of political issues there. They couldn't all get together. And so you had to watch two different debates to, to get a sense of what's going on. And um, you know, we're not going to ponder a whole lot on, on who said what precisely. But, um, but what I did want to do, Mark, is to say what, what I think they should be saying, what they should be touching on. Um, but, and before I do that, you know, any thoughts on your end? Well, the, the two big items that came out to be in, in to me in the debates are this. Um, again, we don't we don't make candidate endorsements. We but we call out the issues that people should be ta talking about. The big loser was pension reform. Not one of the candidates would say, and they were asked specifically, at least on the NBC uh, debate, whether they would support a constitutional amendment to reform pensions, and they all said no. Uh, that means no pension reform because you have to remember that all those unfunded liabilities that you all uh, always read about, those are entirely for work already performed for tier one workers. So when candidates dodge the question and say, well, I'm going to change uh, pensions going forward to make it a 401 Kyle thing, that's fine. Uh, and we certainly, we certainly support that, but it does not fix the problem, which is those unfunded pension liabilities. Uh, that's number one. A second topic that we've advocated for strongly is school choice. Uh, that came up once. Um, I, I think probably all the Republicans would favor it, uh, but it wasn't a topic. They didn't emphasize it. It's per per perplexing to me that they don't do that because it has overwhelming su support. We've, we've talked about the polls on this before. It's like 85% of Americans believe in school choice, and it cuts across all the all the usual political lines, Democrats, blacks, whites, everybody, uh, poor, rich. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's true even in Chicago, and the Chicago ought to be the first place to, to embrace school choice. But they're dropping the ball on this, and I think they're making a... Uh, a political mistake, but more importantly, just continuing to damn our our children to schools that aren't worthy of being called schools in many cases. And Ted, you're going to have next week out a, a beautiful report on that. We'll cover that next week. Yeah, just uh, coming back to the pensions, I, you know, it's, you know, there's always a question about politics. What's good politics and what's good policy? And, uh, you know, most people will tell you that it's bad policy to talk about pensions just stay away from them. They're, they're, they're boring, they're uninteresting, and you don't want to scare potential people who, you know, who rely on their pensions and all that. But, you know, we, we've, we've had that. It's been bad politics to talk pensions for so long that, you know, the hole gets deeper, the hole gets bigger, the taxes go higher, there's no plan. And, you know, I, I would argue done properly, it would be good policy and good politics to talk about pension reform. So, um, if everybody's too scared to talk about it when they're candidates, they're sure as hell not going to touch it when they're when they're in power. And you know, they 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 love to tell you, "Oh, I'll do it when I'm in power," but uh, I can't talk about it yet. Well, that's I think that's a that's a fallacy. So, in my opinion, you know, if a candidate can't staunchly say I support a pension amendment, 
you know, they, they can have their different plans. There's, there's a lot of, you know, politics there as well about how you would reform pensions. But if you can't openly say that you're, you support a pension amendment, or, you know, of amending the pension protection clause, then that means you're not able to talk about how you would fix what Mark just said, whether it's the official $130 billion problem or the $300 billion, which is what Moody says, $300 billion state pension problem. So uh, that's number one in my book. If you, you know, we're ignoring crime here for a minute because crime, crime has to be taken care of. And I think they're all, they're all hitting crime pretty hard uh, in terms of, if, in terms of, you know, acting on it. whether they're saying what they would actually do properly, and whether they have a good plan, that's a different issue, but they're not scared to talk about crime. But like you said, Mark, they, they don't, all of them don't necessarily want to talk about pension reforms in the same way. Um, ditto to your school choice stuff. But, um, you know, where, where for me, the other element that you'll never fix Illinois, as long as the public sector unions have all the power and ordinary people don't, uh, because you can't ever you can't ever change property taxes if you can't lower the costs. You, you can't lower property taxes if you can't lower the cost of government, which means lowering the cost of schools and lowering the cost of police and fire and municipal. You've got to be able to lower those costs. And so that means the unions have to have less power and uh, ordinary people have to have more. And, you know, nobody's willing to talk about that. So I, I, I say that's a challenge uh, the, to challenge your challenge your candidate, which ties into the last one, Mark, and you, you should talk about this a little bit more. Every one of those candidates, candidates should be bashing Amendment 1. And that's where uh, Amendment 1, that's on the ballot in November. And voters will have a choice whether to enshrine the collective bargaining laws that we have in this state into the Constitution. And um, we should be bashing the hell out of that because it's bad policy. Illinois will never be fixed as long as Amendment 1 becomes real. Yeah, we intend to continue to bash the hell out of it. I think, it, hope it'll, it'll become a primary topic, may, maybe the most important thing that's on the ballot in, in November. Um, it's kind of appropriate maybe that we skipped over for the primary because I assume all, at least all the Republican gubernatorial candidates oppose it. But it's a monstrosity. We've written about this before. It's a little difficult to summarize how bad it is because the implications are so broad. It would basically override hundreds and hundreds of, of laws on the books in the state of Illinois, create this new constitutional right that's right up there with the First Amendment and everything else to allow any employee, public or private, to form a collective bargaining unit with however large or few a group they prefer and demand anything that affects their economic interests. Um, so you can be sure that uh, the Chicago Teachers Union, for starters, would be demanding you know, rent controls and uh, housing assistance and all kinds of things like that. Uh, but the you know, the issues that that raises are just mind boggling because um, for starters, it would be the end of of uh, true collective bargaining, which we have now where there's one union that goes through a, a, a very specific legal process to get certified to negotiate on behalf of all workers. Um, and uh, boy, the, you know, the other implications we'll be writing about and hopefully we'll get some other legal scholars to chime in on this because I'm comfortable that any neutral legal scholar is going to look at this thing and just pull their hair out because it's it's so broadly overwritten. And uh, one thing's for sure is that being in the courts for God knows how long on countless lawsuits because a lot of this is preempted by federal law and sorting out preemption issues um, is a very difficult matter that's already litigated constantly. And this thing on its face purports to override uh federal law on collective bargaining and federal law on workers safety well that's just crazy um so we'll see but uh hopefully people are going to start paying attention to this and the press is going to wake up on it yeah and and mark you know you you brought up a lot of the good legal arguments and then the practical arguments are such that you know right now the public sector unions they're they're protected right but they're protected by the pension protection clause so they have lifetime pensions guaranteed no matter what's happening to the economy no matter what's happening to you know the ordinary residents and whether they have jobs or not whether there's a recession um, you know they're stuck paying a bill that's uh that's guaranteed well this amendment one 
would then add guaranteed provisions for collective bargaining, which means, you know, public sector workers, you know, guaranteed these long term contracts with guaranteed pay, guaranteed benefits. Um, it would just make it impossible to fix the state ever again, because everything would one be litigated and two, who's going to take on the unions every time. And, and I think if we just, you know, we started the show by talking about out, out migration. Well, what what choice will people have if there's a pension protection clause and a workers' rights protection clause in the Constitution? Most people, unless you're super wealthy and don't care, your your choice will be I've got to move to a place like Indiana that doesn't have such things, or to Wisconsin, or like many people are doing, Tennessee, Florida, Texas. You know, it gets boring saying that, but that's what's happening. And so uh, we'll just see more of that. That hundred thousand that we just saw in the IRS number or the 114,000 population loss uh, for 2021 reported by the census estimate, uh, those things might just be the beginning of a much bigger tide if such things pass. Yeah. So, so Mark, that kind of gets us, you know, further to the problems of Illinois. Um, we, we celebrated and we, I should say governor Pritzker celebrated, not just the, um, the population discussion that we just talked about, uh, but he's also celebrated some of the credit, upgrades that Illinois has had. We've had all three rating agencies upgrade uh, Illinois after 20 years of, of straight downgrades. So, um, you know, that that was, you know, you can call it relatively good news, all based on the nearly $200 billion that we got from the federal government. But, you know, that printing press, uh, that, that massive handout, $6 trillion of handouts, yeah, might have re- resulted in us and New Jersey and Connecticut, who also never saw upgrades for 20 years. Uh, it might have resulted in upgrades, but there's been a huge cost to that. And this is the real cost that, you know, everybody seems to ignore. And that's, you know, what you, like you've said in your piece, you know, what the government, what the government giveth, it can take it away. Yep. But uh, uh, credit upgrades are nice because normally they mean that the uh, state will get a little bit better interest rate next time they sell bonds because they're, their risk is deemed a little bit lower. But that doesn't work when the same forces that allowed you to get that credit rating created far bigger problems that more than canceled out whatever savings you were getting get on that interest rate. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, just last week, Illinois priced a new bond offering. And this is written up in the the bond buyer, which is the major trade magazine for the municipal bond industry. All the numbers are in our article that we'll post along with this. Uh, but our um, interest rates for Illinois have roughly uh, go, gone up by roughly 50%, 50% since January 1st, when all the markets started to tank, uh, largely because of inflation. So you had it's actually ten billion, ten trillion dollars that the that the federal government has thrown on the economy in the past two years. Ted six of from the Treasury, another another four, at least five from uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, two hundred billion of that has gone into Illinois, including eleven billion directly to the state. Well, yeah, I would give Illinois a credit upgrade in that circumstance. But Illinois is not going to default on its bonds over the next few years, which is primarily what they're interested in. But the consequence is inflation, and inflation means higher interest rates on everything because bond buyers have to be compensated for their loss from inflation and because the Federal Reserve will start raising rates to fight inflation, which, of course, they've been doing. Uh, So interest rates across the board are way up. Treasuries, too, the benchmark 10-year treasury is up 50% since the first of the year. Mortgages, of course, are up everything. So that more than cancels out the savings that Illinois achieved on this new bond offering from its credit downgrade. The same forces that allowed the credit upgrade, namely this big dump of federal money, fueled inflation and drove up not just the state's borrowing costs, but by all the borrowing costs, everything that we borrow money for, cars, homes, everything. And we're all paying for it now. And boy, you see Pritzker and especially Comptroller Susanna Mendoza forever bragging about this, uh, uh, these credit upgrades that they, they claim is they're doing too and has nothing to do with the federal government's uh, dump of cash. It's just preposterous. 
That's not why they got the upgrades, and it's not going to do us any good. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, you know, Governor Pritzker was one of the leading proponents of the bailouts. Uh, you know, Illinois was one of the biggest pushers and proponents of, of bailouts because, well, because we were near near junk rating just before COVID hit. So, um, so yeah, the celebrations seem to only go one way, and they ignore the second part. Ted, one other thing that's pertinent, we'll have an article up uh, to this. Um, Illinois is now a net taker state from the federal government, and not just by a little, but by a lot. Uh, this is a constant topic, it has been for decades in Illinois, when in past decades, Illinois indeed sent more money to the federal government than it took back. Uh, the topic is called the balance of payments with the federal government. And there's two studies that are followed widely each year that track this. One is from the Rockefeller Institute and the other is from the comptroller of the state of New York. New York traditionally had this problem. Uh, but this year, the most recent year covered, 2020, well, first of all, every state became a taker because of that dump of federal cash. Every state. And guess which ones were the biggest takers? Uh, big blue states that have traditionally complained about this problem, uh, Illinois and New York. Uh, Illinois and New York are in the top uh, six, I believe. We'll get those exact numbers into the article. And uh, so it, it really tells you something about where this money went. California, by the way, is the biggest. I'm talking per capita, too, adjusted for population. Um, so, uh, <laughs> again, Susanna Mendoza likes to always say that Illinois is getting cheated by the federal government because we consistently spend send more money to the federal government uh, than we get back. Well, it's not true. It hasn't been true for a number of years, by the way. The Rockefeller Institute did a six-year look back, and Illinois is a net taker um, in, in aggregate over those six years. And lastly, it, it just the height of hypocrisy for progressives to be complaining about this issue because the overwhelming reason why states that are usually net net givers to the federal government is because of progressive tax rates and their high income taxpayers. So places like New York and Illinois, which are relatively rich, send a lot more to the federal government per person than, uh, than poorer states. That's typically given to the case. So when progressives complain about what they're effectively saying is, well, we don't really believe in progressive tax rates. We want this claw back. Give us the money back that you took from our rich people. That's what they're saying. And just outrageous. Yeah, Mark, that's uh, I, I can't wait to see your piece. Um, just one last thing I want to highlight before we let everybody go. Uh, one thing and, and, you know, people are seeing it, you know, Matt Rosenberg wire points just recently, not, not so long ago. And, what we're starting to do is, and our goal is, is to keep accumulating the data that, that we think is necessary to, to be able to talk about some of the big inner city problems in, you know, Chicago, but not just Chicago, but Rockford and Decatur, you know, and, and, and cities like that. And uh, we put out a really interesting piece, and it was the births to unwed mothers. You know, a lot of what we're looking at is not just the problems that we have in terms of crime and, and ed, you know, you know uh, poor education and, and low income uh, for certain people, but uh, we're looking at some of the, the, the causes under them, and, and one of them that just has been totally ignored is this births to unwed mothers, um, unmarried births, and I'm just going to throw out a couple facts, and we'll leave that, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll talk about it next week, but um, what's fascinating is, is, is a trend that people say is very racist to talk about, but uh, when we peeled back the numbers, we, uh, we the IDPH for this, and we found that, you know, Chicago, of course, everybody talks about that. 82% of, of black births um, in, in 2020 were to uh, unwed mothers. But it's just not, it's not just Chicago. Uh, you take a place like Rockford, or let me say Peoria. Peoria, 90% of all black births were to unwed mothers. Uh, it was the same thing, I think, in, in, in Rock, well, out Rockford, 85%. These are, these are massive numbers, and uh, it's hard to think about when you look at all the correlations between uh, unwed births or, you know, or, or the lack of a two-parent family and, uh, and you look at incomes, educational results, and, and uh, crime, it's, it's a massive correlation. Uh, 
Uh, but but it's not just that. It's uh, you know we we looked at Decatur, fifty five percent of white births were to unwed mothers. Um, that's huge. And, and uh, you know there's another one that's uh, fifty percent. I forget which one, but you know Palatine. Uh, well, yeah, Pal uh, Peoria, forty three percent of whites. Rockford, fifty percent of whites. So this is a problem. It's not a, just a race problem. It's an income problem. Uh, it's an education problem. It's a broad problem. But uh, these are the kind of things that we think belong back in the discussion. Um, these are root cause problems that need to be solved in addition to the immediate crime problems and things like that. But uh, when we talk about our education paper that's coming out next next Wednesday about, you know, focuses on Decatur, but it's statewide, they all tie in together. And uh, we have a lot of problems to solve, not just in Illinois, but in, in the country. Uh, but a lot of that is getting back to, in, in, in my opinion, some of these core things that family matters, education matters, merit and competence matter, and we've got to start demanding those things. Yeah, Ted, there's one, one sociologist, Charles Murray, who said this is the one topic that all sociologists agree on, that uh, birth to unwed mothers is the predominant factor driving crime and intergeneration, intergenerational poverty. And, uh, of course, when, when conservatives talk about it, they get branded as racist, but the fact is that Obama was all over this until he became president when he stopped talking about it. Uh, people like Don Lamont on CNN used to rail against it too. But that was, you know, 10 years ago before the madness of this cancel culture that uh, picks out certain things and labels them as racist uh, took hold in America. Uh, well, we don't back down in the face of that kind of stuff. And uh, salute to our colleague, Matt, who is uh, compiling the evidence and we're going to stay on it. Yeah, this, uh, you know, no matter what you say, 90% of, of births to blacks in Decatur uh, unwed mothers, it, there's there's no way to have success with that. And what's what's uh, I'm going to tease it here and we're going to end it here. Um, we're looking at the incomes. And when you start looking at dual dual parent incomes, blacks, it's phenomenal how well they do. Um, and, um, you know, you'll see that there's a there's a big bonus for being married. So uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. But um, thanks, and um, thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. And just one final salute to the uh, single moms that are out there that are getting the job done. There are some of them that work out very well, but in general, it's just not true. Thanks for hearing us out. Thank you.